Thank you. So we continue session five now talking about uh, transdermal delivery systems that we refer to as TDS products. They are also often known as patches or extended release films. And in my presentation, I will go over some of the product development considerations for these products. And these are my views and not the official policies or views of the agency. So what is equivalence for generic products? One of the important components of establishing equivalence uh, is pharmaceutical equivalence, meaning that a generic product needs to uh, have the same active ingredient, same dosage form, for the same route of administration, and have the same strength as the reference product. The generic product needs to also be bioequivalent to the reference product, meaning uh, that it should uh, not have significant differences in the rate and extent of absorption and delivery at the site of action. Um, when the product has established pharmaceutical equivalent PE and bioequivalent BE, then it's, uh, we expect that the product would perform the same for the patient as the ROD. However, for complex drug products such as uh, TDS products, uh, establishing BE is not that simple and it's actually um, a little bit more complex, meaning that because of some of the complexities associated with these drug products or the dosage form, um, you need, there are some scientific considerations that you need to take into account when developing these drug products to make sure that they perform the same for the patient. Transdermal drug products, as opposed to many other dosage forms here, the strength is defined by the nominal drug delivery rate and not by the drug load or drug concentration in the product. And the strength is adjusted by the size of the product. Uh, there are some um, acceptable and allowable differences with, uh, in terms of some of the properties of the drug product between a test product and a reference product. For example, we have high quality um, generic TDS products that have established BE to the RLD, but they may have different drug load, they have, may have different sizes, different thickness, different adhesive material, or may come in different appearances. So compared to the reference listed drug uh, TDS product, a generic TDS that has the same strength as the RLD may have different drug load, different formulation composition, and as a result, different residual drug amount following application, or different sizes or shape. And these differences are acceptable as long as the TDS, the test TDS, perform the same as RLD. Um, and some of these differences, for example, drug load or the design, may affect some properties of the dosage forms of the TDS product, for example, affect the heat effect of the product, or meaning that a test TDS that um, performs the same to the RLD in under normal condition may not perform the same when it's exposed to heat. And I will talk more about um, these aspects. So these allowable differences that I mentioned, for example, differences in active ingredients, in the dosage form uh, design, or in the drug load or shape of the TDS, they may result into failure mode for bioequivalence uh, equivalence. Meaning that, for example, when you're having different inactive ingredients or different adhesive material, your test TDS product may not um, adhere the same as the RLD and may have different adhesive properties. And that's the failure mode for BE. Or may not have um, the same heat effect or maybe may have worse um, heat effect than the RLD. And that's the failure mode for TE. So we uh, need to make sure that all these failure modes are addressed and we have a um, high quality uh, generic TDS product accessible to the patients. And in my presentation, I will um, talk about uh, some of these uh, product development considerations that can impact, for example, uh, adhesion of the TDS product to the skin and how you need to establish proportional similarity of your test TDS product to the RLD and what consideration you need to have in mind when designing the heat effect studies and what is our recommendation. So, um, for example, as I mentioned, a, a test TDS may have a different formulation or design or different size compared to the RLD. And um, with regards to the shapes, here are um, the typical shape of the TDS product that we see. And when you're, for example, developing your test TDS for an RLD that has a circular shape, and you want to choose a shape with um, sharp corners, such as how it's shown in the picture, 
So your test product may be more prone to lifting from the edges, as it's shown here, um, and therefore have different adhesive properties compared to the test product. Or when you're developing a long rectangular shaped test product for an RLD that is, a, uh, that is round, then your product, depending on what anatomical site or at what orientation you apply the product, it may experience different torsional strains, and as a result, your adhe adhesion study may fail compared to the RLD. For example, when the patient um, subject apply the test product on, on his or her back and stretch the back, um, the test product may partially detach. And a circular shape RLD product may not get affected by these torsional strains um, as much as uh, your test product with a different shape that might affect it. And you need to know at the end of the day, your test uh, TDS product must perform the same as RLD um, no matter what orientation it is applied. So the next talking point is related to proportional similarity of the TDS. Imagine we have a TDS with three strength, 50, 100, 150 microgram per hour. And here is a hypothetical RLD TDS. That comes in t three different sizes, and usually it's a big laminate, and we cut three different sizes out of one laminate. And if um, we imagine like five centimeters square delivers at 50 microgram per hour, then when you double the size, usually um, you expect the dose to get doubled as well. And here is the test CDS product. That may come in different sizes, as I mentioned. But what is important here, and I want to emphasize here is, oh, first, that um, when the pro test product established BE to the RLD, it gets the same nominal strength as the RLD. And with regards to the, uh, the point that I want to make here is that whatever proportional proportionality exists for the actual surface area of the RLD should be the same for the actual surface area of the test product. And um, for example, here, if we imagine that the mid strength is a bio strength, the mid strength of the test product can establish BE to the mid strength of the RLD through an in vivo BE study, and the um, other strengths may get approval based on acceptable dissolution test and uh, establishing proportional similarity uh, between all this across all strength of the R uh, test and RLD product. And when in our guidances we talk about proportional similarity, we actually mean identical amount of ingredients per unit of active surface area for all strength and identical ratios of the active surface areas of the test and RLD TDS. So in most of the cases uh, with TDS products, the same proportionality that exists for the uh, active surface area also exists for the nominal strength. But there might be an exception. For example, in the case of Exelon Rivastigmin TDS product, here the ratios of labeled strength are not proportional and the same as ratios of the actual surface area or actual drug load. So when you're developing a test TDS for this RLD, which proportionality you need to follow? You actually need to base your proportional similarity on the ratios of the actual surface area and the drug load and not based it on the ratios of the nominal strength. Now, next topic is related to heat uh, effect studies and impact of heat on TDS performance. So there are multiple scenarios or instances, instances um, that a patient may uh, get exposed to heat while wearing a TDS product. For example, um, taking hot shower or using heating blanket, or as it's shown in this picture, um, a person is wearing a TDS product on her lower abdomen and then uh, putting on a hot water bottle on top of it. And it's important to make sure that the test TDS product performs the same as RLD and it's not yet impacted by the heat um, very differently than the RLD. For example, we don't want to see that a test product experience dose dumping when it's exposed to heat. And depending on different heat exposure scenarios, where the heat is applied, is it applied earlier in the uh, TDS du uh, application duration, later in the application duration, or it's a continuous heat, for example, using heating blanket overnight. Um, so it can uh, differently affect uh, the performance of the TDS product. 
For example, here is the study that was done on fentanyl TDS products um, to study heat effect. I'm not going through the details of the study. The reference is provided for you to look at. But in summary, I want to show um, how heat can affect the performance and bioavailability of the TDS when it's applied early, early on in the application. No. The um, clicker wasn't working. Now it's working. Sorry about that. So um, how is it different when it's ap uh, applied earlier in the application period when the uh, concentration has not reached a steady state? And how the effect of heat may continue even after the heat was removed? And how the product that was exposed to heat may even underperform for hours after heat exposure? And how it can be a different situation and how uh, the TDS can differently get affected when the heat is applied later on when the product has reached CMAX or is, uh, at steady state level. So we at agency, um, we understand that these in vivo heat effect studies are difficult to conduct. And there is subject safety concern associated to it. That's why if, uh, as part of GADUFA regulatory science program, we have invested enormous amount of research on this topic and try to uh, um, develop in vitro approach based on IVPT studies to evaluate heat effect on um, t test TDS product and compare to the RLD. So here is an example of a study that we did on nicotine TDS products. And the goal was to see whether the in vitro could predict the in vivo situations when it comes to the heat effect on TDS products. Uh, we picked two different nicotine TDS products um, that have the same strength. Um, as you can see, there are differences in terms of sizes and inactive ingredients. But these two, pro uh, two TDS products are pharmaceutically equivalent, but not necessarily bioequivalent. And we didn't, because of those differences that we see um, in the inactive ingredient, we did not necessarily expect them to have um, the same heat effect. So in our study design, we had two different heat exposure scenarios. In one of them, the heat was applied, applied earlier on in the TDS application. And in the second design, the heat was applied later during the um, heat um, TDS application. We had harmonized in vivo clinical study and in vitro permeation test study design. So the same study design that I mentioned was used in in vivo clinical study and IVPT study. And we wanted to evaluate whether IVPT results could predict the in vivo results when it comes to heat effect. So here are the results for in vitro in vivo relationship that we established. And, used, and we used two different approaches. So here is the result for approach one, that is the prediction Prediction was based on in vitro data only. And um, here, as you can see that the predicted concentration profile for the uh, nicotine in red reasonably matched the observed, con so, sorry, the observed concentration profile in red reasonably matched the predicted concentration profile in blue. And we see reasonably good correlation for two different heat exposure scenarios and for two different products. And we got similar results using a different approach. And I won't go through the details of these approaches. The reference is provided for you if you're interested. Um, but our message is IVPT results were reasonably predictive of um, nicotine TDS heat effects in vivo. And I think um, currently IVPT is the best tool to evaluate heat effect of for the TDS, um, sorry, test TDS and compared to the RLD. So in conclusion, as I mentioned, TDS products have unique uh, complexities and can show unique failure modes for VE. Um, generic TDS products should perform the same for the patient as RLD, despite those um, allowable and acceptable differences that I mentioned may exist in the design or formulation between an RLD and um, generic TDS. And um, FDA's VE standards for TDS products comprehensively evaluate potential failure modes for VE to ensure that patients have access to high quality generic TDS products. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, colleagues at OGD and OPQ, and especially my team members, and our collaborators at the University of Maryland. Thank you very much. <laughs>